Good evening, uh, everyone. My name is Justin. I'm one of the co-chairs for the uh, SIR RFS Communications Committee. Um, we'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's very informative session on pediatric trauma and IR, uh, brought to you by the Pediatric Service Line. Um, so this session will be recorded, as always, and be available on YouTube afterwards. If you have any questions, please leave them towards the end um, or type them in the questions text box, and we will uh, cover them at the very end of the session. Uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and give the presentation over to Megan Lazaga, who's our uh, organizer liaison from the Pediatric Service Line. Go ahead, Megan. Hi, I'm Megan Lazaga. I'm one of the co-chairs for the Pediatric Service Line for the SIR RFS. Um, today we have Dr. Anne-Marie Cahill from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia giving a, us a talk over the fundamentals of trauma intervention in a pediatric patient. Um, Dr. Cahill, take it away. Okay, thank you, Megan. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be speaking on pediatric trauma and IOR, and it's, it's great to have, uh, you know, 18, 20 people on who are able to sort of you know, get an insight into what we do in a very big um, tertiary pediatric center. Um, at CHOP, we have over 600 beds, and we have three pediatric interventional uh, rooms running every day. Uh, we have all sorts of trauma that I will speak about tonight and speak about some of the limitations for trauma intervention uh, and statistics. So. Um, just to get started here, I'm going to talk about, as we say, the state of the nation for pediatric trauma. I'm going to discuss some case examples of pediatric vascular trauma, which is actually rather uncommon across international um, locations, not just in the States. And I'm going to, as I go along, just review the existing literature, which is not that much on pediatric um, trauma uh, from an IR point of view. Now, just looking here at the um, PubMed search that I did, as always, we try and do on children, perspective randomized, and trauma embolization, particularly, which is kind of the focus of this talk. And you can see there's nothing that's even related to that, so zero on that. So in terms of the uh, level one evidence, we're not going to have any significant um, evidence in that category because we have nothing randomized. So in terms of children and trauma, uh, why do we not have that much exposure to pediatric interventional uh, trauma? It is um, because we don't have that much in the way, believe it or not, of accidents. If you look here at the uh, journal Pediatrics, a very acclaimed pediatric journal uh, from the American Academy of Peds, this is the latest that I could find in terms of statistics. But if you look at all the uh, 20,000 causes uh, children that have died from various reasons, you will see that about 7,000 of them are related to unintentional injuries or accidents. And that's across the United States with a 320 million population. So when you spread that out among all the children's hospitals, level one, two, or three, we're not seeing a huge number um, every year, even thankfully, from the fatality point of view. Um, in terms of looking at the next diagram here, in terms of trauma, malignancy, heart disease, and HIV, these are big, big categories. You can see here that the rate of trauma continues to diminish right up until the um, 20, uh, the latest I have here. Um, is 2000, I'm sorry, some of my webinar is blocking the screen here, um, but way up here to 2009 approximately. And you can see we've kind of got a gradual decline in malignancy, thankfully, a steady state with heart disease and HIV, but a significant drop in, the, in trauma rates per 100,000, which is good. And that's just due to all of the preventative measures and awareness that's been out there since 1981. Now, there is a National Trauma Data Bank report from 2013, again, one of the more recent ones that I could find. And if you look at the selection by age, you can see here that the vast majority of patients, you know, uh, between one and 10 years of age have, you know, injuries are related to falls. And below that, of course, a much lower number, but also it's 
falls by far from neonate on. When, when you get to the teenage years, it increases in the range of the motor vehicle accident, particularly when you get to 15 and above. Look at that huge spike in the reasons for um, mechanism of injury. So again, falls to motor vehicle accidents. And that's the graph up the top left also reflects that. Again, it's just a graphic depiction of that table below. So we obviously have to be aware of the types of injuries that we're going to expect in the various age groups. Our own 20-year statistics at shop and looking at the number of admissions, which steadily have increased. It looks like it's going down, but the trend line is going up. Uh, our chief of trauma surgery shop does not, and he's in the National Registry, have a good reason for why the admissions are going up. But certainly, if you look at the deaths, length of stay, and the in injury severity scores, they're all dropping. Uh, admissions for o overnight, at least, have increased. And this is all the way up to 2017. This is the latest data from our statistics. And then if you look here at the ages, our ages have stayed pretty constant this whole time, around eight, nine years of age, interestingly, with an extremely low mortality. Uh, incident severity scores are, are pretty high here. And the length of stay is you know, all in the range of two to three days. So they're, stay, they're staying for observation, medium in injury severity scores and yeah for some reason they all tend to be around that eight to nine year age group not the teenage group which is interesting that's up to 2014 that actual numeric data now why is this so particularly where we are in philadelphia um access to trauma centers if you look here the red shows the areas of highest injury death rates greater than 50 percent um and access, sorry, access to trauma centers less than 60 minutes. So it does make sense that if you have an access to trauma centers within one hour of a major trauma center, ideally level one, you're going to have a lower incidence of mortality as opposed to out here in the Midwest and beyond where your population is very low and the trauma center for could be Denver for multiple states around. So it does correlate with your proximity to trauma centers. And then looking at mortality per 100,000, you can see here, it correlates again with proximity to a major trauma center. Having the highest pockets greater than 50 per 100,000 um, away from major trauma centers in areas that are less populated and much more rural and including a big red, dark red spot there over Alaska. So extremely, um, you know, strong statistical um, correlation here. So why do we not see that much in terms of pediatric endovascular trauma? I mean, it's a very difficult specialty to get good at because you don't have that number. As a CHOP, we might see children for an endovascular embolization maybe three, four times a year. And that would not usually be external trauma, as in motor vehicular falls. It's actually, when I'll show you cases later, iatrogenic trauma. We have more of that within the building than we have referred into the building for this kind of work. Needless to say, no matter how you get it, getting it is important so you can gain the skill. And so, for example, here, comparing adult and pediatric trauma care. This is a very, very nice study with large numbers. The adult trauma center, 607, the pediatric, 339, and it's comparing pediatric patients, okay? And so those seen at a pediatric center, those seen at an adult. And if you look down here at the splenic procedures, for example, and the transfusion rates and the embolization rates, the number of procedures, either surgery, or embolization or transfusion is significantly higher when a child is treated at an adult trauma center than a pediatric trauma center, statistically highly significant. Down here, the embolization rate is only 0.6%, two in 339 patients. That explains why our exposure to this is very low. Looking at the same thing for solid organ liver, 
you can see the higher a lower rate of procedure 5.9 for the liver versus the spleen um, grade 4 and 5 so important to know your grades 14% uh, still lower than the spleen but look under the pediatric trauma center nobody in that cohort got uh, embolized and transfusion rates again significantly lower for uh, the pediatric trauma center and why is this? Well, this is because pediatric surgeons take a much more conservative approach to pediatric trauma. You must be, in general, up at about 40 mils per kilo replacement for you to actually be thinking about being unstable enough in terms of like continuous bleeding to refer them for an endovascular procedure or a surgical procedure. When you're talking about an adult, you 10 per kilo, we are much heavier, is enough to drive the adult surgeons to talk about doing something in an adult. And if you look at the adult surgeons, and this kind of explains why, once you're getting to 20 per kilo, the adult surgeon is getting uncomfortable with the pediatric patient. A pediatric surgeon is not getting uncomfortable realistically till you get to at least 40 per kilo. So again, very conservative approaches, and that's reflected here on the bar chart down here in terms of adult and pediatric. Much more angio in the adult than the pediatric patient along across all of this, and non-operative intervention is clearly higher um, for the pediatric than the adult when you compare an OR higher certainly here than um, the pediatric for the adult. Multiple solid organ injuries way up there in terms of endovascular intervention for an adult than a pediatric patient. Little higher, but certainly not high. And solid organ with brain, obviously they end up much more in the OR because with the brain injury, obviously that drives a lot of the surgical intervention. So those levels are higher, not so much for the solid organ. It's the traumatic brain injury that drives that. So we are more conservative in terms of who gets to the IR suite. And looking at solid organ injuries here, a retrospective um, study that was uh, about five years here, there were seven level one pediatric trauma centers, including ours, a very nice study in 2005 from the Journal of Trauma. And uh, there were 1,800 study population, two thirds of the male, and 1,729 were successfully non-operatively managed. 89 failures uh, for non-operative management and the mortality rate was extremely low, 0.8%. Why did that happen? The non-operative failure rate was mostly pancreatic injury and that overall failure rate was only 5%. And interestingly, persistent hemorrhage was only 16%. Uh, mostly shock and peritonitis resulted in them going to the OR as opposed to persistent hemorrhage that may have gone to endovascular um, therapy. Um, hollow viscous injury, of course, is not treated by pediatric IR. It's treated by surgical resection of the hollow viscous portion that's injured, and the pancreas the same. So really, shock and peritonitis is what drove the intervention. Uh, from a surgical point of view, not the persistent hemorrhage for most part there. Uh, time to failure. Well, it seems like when you have solid organ injury, it start, over time, the patient has basically, by 50% in three hours, has declared themselves as needing an intervention or not. And all of them, by 72 hours, has declared the need for intervention or not. Um, you can see here, in terms of the failure, that non-operative man-being failure in that study, this is from that study, you can see that really the decision point here was at about three hours, whether somebody was aggressively going to be managed by something such as an endovascular therapy in IR, and by 24 hours, significantly, 87% had that decision made. But what's interesting is that by two, one to two hours, you kind of know where you stand in terms of having to intervene. And of course, like we've seen, expect the spleen and the liver drive a lot of that. Certainly, um, the spleen uh, within one to two hours had revealed itself as either being very unstable or not, and 1.5 hours for 
the liver, and then grapping. So basically, um, spleen and liver were the highest yield. We've, and we can see that ourselves in our own experience, that we tend to get a delayed embolization, maybe 24, 48 hours later for more of a kidney and a liver than a you know, grade four or five splenic injury. That, that would be our experience also. Um, the um, in, um, admission injury severity scores, you can see again, they're going to be higher correlating with the liver and splenic injury. So you're going to have a higher admission injury score at one to, with one to two hours of instability and needing intervention than you will uh, for uh, lower injury scores. It, it makes sense. Now, in terms of this, you probably see this quite a bit, uh, a contrast blush, uh, and this is a surgical paper, a contrast blush in the spleen was associated with an increased need for blood transfusion, but not necessarily an increased need for operative intervention. And the same, a contrast blush in the liver or in the intraperitoneal area was, again, because they're bleeding, that is a sign on CT imaging, was um, also associated with an increased need for transfusion, and you would consider intravascular embolization, but not necessarily needed. Again, it depends on your level of comfort with and stability of the patient. If the patient is unstable in the ER or on admission, they tend to go to the OR and not get endovascular therapy. The reason being, it takes time to set up, get the team in, they may be too unstable by the time they get to interventional radiology. And what I mean by unstable is they're hypotensive, they're not responding to fluid replacement, they're tachycardic. Um, and that is a surgical call. But those kind of patients with grade 5 liver spleen injuries, possible hollow viscous injury, known duodenal or pancreatic injuries are operative candidates. They're not endovascular. They're also the ones that, as you've seen, patients are not, uh, people are not managing non-operatively for 24 to 48 hours. Hence why we're sort of seeing a low number that end up in the IR suite. And this is a very important thing. You manage the physiology of the patient, not the anatomy of the injury. And, and it's the surgeons, most pediatric surgeons believe in this sort of a mantra that management without surgery does not mean management without a surgeon. It just means the surgeon is not going to intervene unless necessary. And that also means not management without an IR person. So they don't. Just because you're managed surgically does not mean you'll end up in the OR. And that may be quite different, potentially, to the adult world. We don't have that much literature in children. I would say that this is the largest study that is out there over an 11-year period of 97 patients undergoing angiography with uh, 54 patients undergoing 62 embolizations. And this is from a group in Chicago. And Chicago has a lot of trauma, as you know, a very, very busy city. And this was over an 11-year period that we had 97 patients. So that's less than 10 patients a year. And of that, only 62 embolizations. So that's about six a year. That would make sense. And um, you can see here that um, most of them had effect 47, 87% uh, had effective control. Um, death occurred, unfortunately, in 12. And looking at what we use, and I'll be showing you examples, the vast majority in this paper had one site, which is, makes it a lot less challenging. Um, it was basically divided between pelvis and visceral solid organs, and that means liver, spleen, and kidney, and they broke them down there. And then a lot of the times in pediatric intervention radiology, if it's not very clear of the site of bleeding, you want to decrease the perfusion pressure if it's liver, if it's spleen, uh, or, or kidney. And you may just use gel foam slurry uh, alone, which happened in 26% of these patients. The 26, 48% of these patients, half of them got gel foam slurry alone, and another 24% got slurry with some coils. And so that is um, certainly something that may or may not be, I feel that it's, it may be more common in pediatrics. We want to do something temporary because they're children, if at all possible, not something permanent. 
Again, we have case reports otherwise that I'm going to show you here. So that's probably the biggest paper in terms of endovascular embolization, which I'd encourage you to take a closer look at from a pediatric point of view. Uh, we have cases, uh, case reports now of traumatic hepatic artery laceration, for example, managed by transarterial embolization. And that was in one pediatric patient. And we have a primary hepatic artery embolization in pediatric blunt hepatic artery trauma. Again, one patient. So the vast majority are case reports, case theories, and um, that larger paper from Chicago. Now, again, the numbers. People are reporting very small numbers. This is, is angiographic embolization is safe and effective for blunt abdominal trauma in children is the title. And look at the numbers, really small numbers. I mean, we're talking, you know, um, one, two for a grade four, three for a grade four kidney, uh, four or five, very small numbers. And doing a meta-analysis of the literature here, again, really small numbers, one and two patients. So unfortunately, nobody has, we probably, we are looking at our data now, but nobody has a very expansive experience in um, embolization in pediatrics uh, because of the volume that they see. So nothing that can be class A or level one evidence. Now, looking at some examples, and we'll talk about more of the management as we go through. I have a, I have a significant number of iatrogenic examples because, as I said, we don't have that many cases uh, coming from the ED. And but it all is still all relevant. It's all trauma, pseudoaneurysms. So here, this is a pseudoaneurysm that occurred in the cath lab uh, with um, a cardiac catheterization. And for those of you who may not know what that is or have seen it, this is a pulsatile collection that is not a true endothelial lumen that's exuding from the femoral artery wall here at the level of the groin with a neck. The yin and yang shows the different directions. Red and blue is towards and away from the producer, uh, transducer, and that's because the flow in these pseudoaneurysms is very turbulent and is going back and forth towards and away from the transducer. Um, in this case, what we did was we accessed each of those dumbbell pseudoaneurysms with a small needle, like a 22-gauge needle, 21-gauge, 22-gauge needle, and injected thrombin. And I'll talk a little bit more about the thrombin later on. And thrombin causes a conversion from fibrin to fibrinogen to fibrin and causes pretty immediate clotting, which is seen here with, by the echogenicity of the contents of these pseudoaneurysms. At the same time as doing this, we compress the neck of the pseudoaneurysm with ultrasound guidance in order to contain the thrombin in the pseudoaneurysm and um, I confirm at the end of the therapy that the femoral artery is patent. Uh, you use very, very small volumes of thrombin. 600 units is 0.6 of thrombin. And it comes in 1,000 units per ml, so hence you're never really going to get to more than 1 ml. And 0.6 or less would be the normal. This is a large pseudoaneurysm here. And I will go into details. There's very little literature on this. We wrote a paper. On this, this is me, second author here, on various pseudoaneurysms in children. I'll show you some other examples, but a couple of these examples are already in this publication. This is a very large one from a 12 trench sheet, and I'm showing this because sometimes a 12 trench sheet can actually be something that you uh, dig hole, even though it's two, three millimeters, because three French is one millimeter, so that's uh, four millimeters, can be closed with thrombin. Not lightly. Uh, this, but it's a very difficult area to treat. Otherwise, you need a covered stent, or you need to actually go in and ligate the, or not ligate, but oversaw the hole. So we gave this um, a go, and you can see here we have this. We we treat it from deep to superficial. The reason being that we didn't want when we had to treat the deeper portion later that we would reflux into the normal femoral artery. We wanted to reflux into the bigger sac first. And that's been published. So you treat the more the deeper portions closer to the artery first very gently. You work your way back into the larger portions. 
until you end up with a large pseudoaneurysm filled with echogenic material, hopefully, and a patent femoral artery. This is a four millimeter neck, so pretty significant here with a lot of different areas that had partly thrombosed and were open looking, revealing the yin yang. And this took 0.8 mils of thrombin. So that's the most we've used here. So never more than one ml. And there are reports again, case reports of this in the literature. In fact, this was a large pseudoaneurysm coming off the femoral artery, and it was actually within the pelvis, just above the common femoral, reported by the Frush group at the time in Duke. Again, a percutaneously treated pseudoaneurysm, not an endovascular treated one in an infant, which is ideal if you can avoid violating an already damaged femoral artery or the contralateral side. So it can be done. And maybe it's because they, uh, of you know, the relative size of the artery versus the pseudoaneurysm. Uh, another one that was treated here in China, again, it was a pseudoaneurysm coming off the iliac artery by percutaneous injection. And very nice images here of showing it having thrombosed with the patent artery remaining. And that was a percutaneous approach. Again, it is something that's more more likely to be performed in children to avoid accessing their femoral artery um, or the artery of choice rather than potentially adults. Do we know the maximum size of the neck? The reports would say when you read them, you know, one to two millimeters. As I said, we got to four millimeters with the 12 French hole, and this is a sizable um, pseudoaneurysm coming off the external iliac artery. So. Jury is out on what size in children would be max. Uh, an interesting one here, uh, also in our paper, and so be thinking outside the box when you have patients that have had any violation of the rectus muscle. It could be a laparoscopic appendectomy. It could be major trauma. Um, they would be the most common things. And this was a patient that presented twice to us in my own practice with um, hematomas of the rectus sheath. We drained them twice and wondered why they were coming back until a very astute Penn resident, actually, so give kudos to the residents at one of our lunchtime conferences with a nice contrast-enhanced CT. I don't recognize anything abnormal on the top scan where we had already drained and there was some air in it, but down here, an enlargement of the inferior epigastric artery compared to the left side on these images. That actually was a pseudoaneurysm of the, the uh, inferior epigastric artery. And when you look here, we actually did do a, an injection of this, which is uncommon, because we wanted to map out the anatomy. And you can see that the inferior epigastric comes right down here to the common iliac, or to the common femoral artery, as you'd expect that the branch, you know, it. it it comes off the, at the level of the common femoral external iliac. So a concern you have here is uh, embolizing the right extremity. Uh, what we did here is we just took 100.1, 100, 100 units of thrombin. You can see here that it's completely thrombosed. Uh, the uh, inferior epigastric is lying above it here, not visible here, not concerned that the inferior epigastric is gone. That, that we can sacrifice in this instance. What we don't want to do is obviously sacrifice the leg. And this is reported, but again, only one case report that I could find of vascular injury in two children with laparoscopic appendectomy. So something to remember, if you end up with a rectus sheath hematoma and they've had any recent laparoscopic procedure, be diligently looking for the inferior epigastric artery and its configuration, either by ultrasound or CT. In that case, we put a pulse ox on the affected limb because that will alert us to having any issues or not with the embolization or with distal embolization of thrombin. Very small syringes anytime you're doing a pseudoaneurysm. One to three ml syringes with a 21 or 22 gauge needle. You pre-fill the slip tip T connector so you don't have dead space. So you know as soon as you start injecting your thrombin, that you are injecting what is in the syringe reflects what is coming out from the slip tip and the needle. We use undilute thrombin. 
we do not dilute it because that increases the chances that it won't be as effective and then will cause a distal embolic situation. So you should never need more than a, one ml. And as you drip in point 0.1, you wait. You watch and wait for the clotting cascade to be activated and your fibrin, inogen to be converted to fibrin. You may need less than you think because it activates the cascade within the pseudoaneurysm and may perpetuate that cascade without giving more trauma. So watch 0.1 a minute, 0.1 for a minute, 0.1, as it's a much more controlled situation that way. There, I have not seen actual papers on ultrasound-guided compression, but we have done it uh, for 30 minutes. If it fails and the neck is appropriate for compression, you can keep the parent artery open and compress the neck only. It may actually work. So in patients that are suitable, either in IOR or in the ultrasound department, we will try ultrasound-guided compression first for 30 minutes and avoid percutaneously using thrombin if we can. Otherwise, we can do direct thrombin injection. It can be done into the solid organ. There are indications for coil embolization, particularly in the adult world. I haven't had to do it yet for a femoral artery pseudoaneurysm. I don't think there's an indication. And you can use techniques such as balloon occlusion and thrombin injection if you feel that the neck is unstable. And some people treat pseudoaneurysms with glue, not something we necessarily do here, but it's an option, and there are reports of that. And uh, as I said, watch and wait and avoid overfilling. The nice thing now is that thrombin is recombinant. So you don't have to worry, as we did in the old days, of bovine thrombin causing increased sensitivity. You had to make sure the patient was aware they'd had an exposure to bovine thrombin. And as a result, they had to, if they're ever sensitized to it again in the OR by using the thrombostatic, they have different pads and gauzes that you can use that contain bovine thrombin in the OR. They can get a sensitivity reaction to the second exposure. And we asked them in the prior bovine thrombin experience, have you ever had a surgery that was for, we had bleeding, any history of having been exposed to thrombin before, et cetera. That is not the same issue anymore. One can use this, and this is another pediatric patient that had an arterial hepatic artery laceration. Now, you could ask, will thrombin work? If it's an end artery situation, my experience, limited as it is, is it doesn't work because your end artery will just continue to bleed around the distal thrombin uh, pseudoaneurysm, and you'll recur around the area that you've thrombosed. In this case, they coiled the pseudoaneurysm endovascularly, uh, but got a recurrence. Now what do you do? So if you have a recurrence, and that is a, a paper here documenting this, you have already coiled the feeding artery. You can now feel more confident about percutaneously treating that pseudoaneurysm with thrombin percutaneously because the feeding artery, the major feeding artery, clearly there's another one, probably retrograde here from this distal hepatic artery, but it's smaller uh, you can probably successfully, and they did here, successfully treat this with thrombin, having a much smaller distal artery. And obviously, the flow would need to be retrograde to refill that th thrombosed pseudoaneurysm. So that's something you can consider if it recurs from the back door, so to speak. And that's one of the issues with just direct injection of thrombin on the pseudoaneurysm. You have a back and front door, much like an aneurysm. And this case report here from Brian Fanaki is showing that the back door, in this case, the distal hepatic artery is the one that recanalized the, or kept the pseudoaneurysm piece. And it's a nice demonstration here of the needle within the pseudoaneurysm, and that would be 0.1 mL or less of thrombin. And it becomes echogenic when it's clotted. So now switching gears a little bit to procedural vascular um, injury. First of all, in children, some things to point out. When you have a vascular trauma and you're bleeding, you have cold, you're, you're cold, you have hypothermic issues. If they're younger, we use um, a heating pad on the top left. A little bit older, we use a bear hugger. Or older still, we have these very large bear huggers for uh, older adult-sized children. And that is a very big concern for anesthesia because if you're giving lots of blood products, they're heated, but they're not body temperature. 
they will already be dropping their temperature with blood products and they're already cold because they've been bleeding. So temperature control is very important. It's also very important to reduce arterial spasm, which you can get once you go in there looking for a bleeding source. Um, depending on the age of the patient, we use small volume syringes so we don't get too carried away with hemodilution and giving a baby a 10 ml flush of saline every time. If they are in shock, we can use smaller accesses like three French catheters. Sometimes you can use a micropuncture set as an arterial sheath and a micro um, catheter. Or we have three and four French sheets, which we use. You do not need to use a larger sheet than someone who's in shock because then you'll probably kill their femoral artery um, because their perfusion is poor to their extremities. We use this flow meter a lot in patients who have fluid balance issues, exactly like I'm saying for shock. It delivers 4 mLs per hour through the pressurized sheet in the leg or wherever your access is. You know that. You can tell anesthesia that. And as a result, they don't have to worry about what's flowing in and out of the vascular sheet in the groin. It is only 4 mLs an hour. They can take that away, subtract that from their fluid requirements for the patient. Um, very important here, you may need straight coils. I mean, they're probably not commonly used in adults, but in children, the vessel can be so spasmed or so small that a straight O1A coil is all you might fit in the vessel. It will not form. A helal or a tornado will not form. And if it doesn't form, it's going to be far longer than you want it to be, and then you run the risk of a non-target um, embolization and, and uh, sacrificing normal vessels. So we love this straight coil. It comes in a 0.5, a 1, a 1.5 centimeter length, depending, and it has little fuzzies on it, and it's pushable, it is not detachable, so you want to be in a safe area, but it is really our friend for a lot of smaller patients and smaller vessels. This is an older case. I haven't had one recently to show you, so the imaging is older, but something to think about. This is a 12-year-old that had a sphincterotomy and had a significant upper GI bleeding. And when we are looking, we're always looking for the blob. In, in this case, the blob was off a branch through the arcade from the SMA, not actually from the gastroduodenal artery. And you can see as you progress here, it becomes more conspicuous as we go through these images. And what we did here is we coiled it. These are all our straight coils taking out branches until we could not see the vascular blush anymore. The nice thing about coiling is you're not going to damage the vessel wall. It is not, they are end arteries. You need to think about a proximal embolization so that you're not killing the bowel wall. So you would not be using something like PVA in a situation of a bowel injury because you are basically cause necrosis of that bowel wall. You would also not use gel foam powder for the same reason because that's 50 microns or less. You would use gel foam slurry or larger coils because that will that will collateralize from the rest of the arcade, the pancreatic or duodenal arcade, and end up um, you know, not damaging bowel lumen integrity. And you can see the final angio here, where we have the, um, the arcade intact, and we have, this is now an uh, embolization, an angio from the celiac, not the SMA. You can see the coils in position, the arcade is patent, and there is no blush. At, uh, from the extravasation. So also beware, it could be a branch from the SMA, not the GDA. So look at both when you have a situation like this. This is a patient that had acute leukemia and needed an end, an end gastroscopy and a duodenal biopsy. And they had an acute drop in hemoglobin after their endoscopy about two hours post, and hemoglobin went down to approximately four. So very significant drop. And if you can appreciate here, there's duodenal hematoma. There was active per rectal bright red blood. And there is a bright blush here in the duodenum. This is not a surgically fix fixable situation. The patient's already got leukemia, has an acute drop in hemoglobin. You're not going to try and resect the duodenum. So this is a very good situation for referral for endovascular therapy, which is what happened. This is a ultrasound of the hematoma here in the duodenum, so we can follow with ultrasound, not with CT scanning, ideally. 
and then we selected out the pancreatic or duodenal branch here, went into the GDA. You can see the duodenal branch here and some expansion here from the hematoma. Now, we didn't see any active bleeding, and I will show you further study. Now, we're very super selective with a low-flow microcatheter. There's no active bleeding, but you can see the void here from the splaying of the wall because of the hematoma. And what we did there is we did gel foam embolization with slurry using two 1 ml syringes and a, a very half-closed three-way stopcock. And the reason we did that is because you want to make the slurry as slick as possible. You can't have it gelatinous. It won't go through a low-flow catheter, which is all we could get in that duodenal branch. So 1 ml syringes, some slurry pledges, kind of half-closed the three-way. Use big, strong hands so that you can sort of try and get it through the half-closed three-way and make it as slimy or as, as watery, inverted commas, as you can. And you can see the negative defect here of the slurry in this vessel. You can see the branches outlined by slurry and contrast. That's why you're seeing a negative defect in this area. That's all we did. Patient did not have any bowel issue related to that. You can see our post here. There's really all of this negative defect here is slurry that we put in these end arteries with gel foam. And this was a week later, the significant reduction in the duodenal hematoma. The patient got an NJ tube, which we passed beyond that after about 48 hours, so you could feed distal to the duodenal hematoma, and you can see significant resolution here in the duodenal hematoma. So again, this is a situation where we would use gel foam and not coils in this scenario um, uh, for this super, super small um, vessel. And that was, in our world, their prophylactic because we couldn't find the blush at that time when the patient uh, arrived in our suite, but it could recur, obviously, and then we have to go back in and revisit the situation. Uh, another thing we see rarely, I've done two or three cases of this in my career so far, um, a trauma to the profunda femoris artery from a pinning of a subcapsule femoral epiphysis. So this patient presented after having a subcapsule femoral epiphyseal uh, pinning with a large leg and pain. And uh, that's how they presented. Bottom line image here is the CT scan with a larger leg and pain. And they had a obviously a surgical intervention recently, so you're thinking of bleeding. Um, they were feeling dizzy. They had other symptoms related to blood loss. And they have a large pseudoaneurysm here coming off what we expected to be and was this profunda femoris branch, or a circumflex femoral, but coming off the profunda femoris. And you can see it's coming off the origin of the profunda femoris artery, and it is an end arterial pseudoaneurysm, because, I mean, could there be a back wall lesion? Sure, but it's basically the, this circumflex humeral or femoral got ligated during the pinning, essentially, is what it looks like there. And what we did here is we coiled it, not the sac. It's going to be a very big coiling. We have no outflow from it when we selectively injected it. And so at that point, what we did here is coil it the entire way in to the pseudoaneurysm. Note there's a tiny little piece of coil hanging into the profunda femoris. I'm glad that wasn't the superficial femoral artery. And that, that last coil, as we say, can kill you every time. It's a tornado. It didn't form so well and kind of hung into the, but that is not a big issue in the profunda femoris. It would be a technically challenging uh, repositioning in the superficial femoral. And basically, this is the follow-up ultrasound without the pseudoaneurysm. And the top here, you can follow the pseudoaneurysm. We saw it in IR before the procedure. And here is the superficial femoral artery and vein, and nothing in the same area um, in, on follow-up. Would I have put percutaneous thrombin in this? Very Not lightly, because this is a major artery that's been transected. So what would happen is around this pseudoaneurysm, you would probably continue to get bleeding and recurrence just in a wider area than that central pseudoaneurysm. It's a high-flow, large artery. So... Not, not one, I think, that would have responded to just trauma.
sorry, I'm just moving on, I hope, to my next slide. Hmm. Okay, sorry. So this has been reported, endovascular treatment of arterial injury as an uncommon complication. There was a case reported here, and only one case, uncommon after orthopedic surgery. So something to be aware of. Uh, again, as I said, just a case report. Nobody has a large series of these. Another thing, uh, African-American female born in 1999, um, so she was nine at the time, uh, with renal dysplasia, ended up with a transplant in 2003. She had multiple renal biopsies performed for possible rejection in 2004 because androcreatinine had been consistently increasing. And we do an ultrasound and we see this sort of picture. Large blobs, very high flow over 160. They should have increased the scale. It was probably 300. Very, so arterial. And you can see here hypoechoic lesions at both upper and lower poles, and you can see a, a dilated vessel, again, bidirectional flow, all arterial. This patient had creatinine of three, and had what was presumed to be AV fistulas slash pseudoaneurysms, interestingly, from the upper and lower pole, where she would have been biopsied as a transplant kidney. Something to think about now in children, significant very significant, I think, for children and something we've just been newly looking at is using CO2 and geography, which I did back then. And I used CO2 and geography to find the, brand, the actual access to the um, transplanted uh, renal artery. And you could see immediately here in just an injection with the sosomni here to kind of scrape along the wall and get in to the renal artery, you can see an immediate connection to the venous system, and you see the IVC contemporaneously filling with the aorta, hence an AV fistula and a, probably a pseudoaneurysm here. This very much looks like the prior picture here of an, an extra blob and a dilated vessel, a second blob in the upper pole. So it's a nice sort of descript, nice correlation. We did one contrast injection, which we used for overlay to actually perform the procedure for just a little bit more definition and you can see here the AV fistula and this expanded probable pseudoaneurysm. There was no active extravasation at the time. We coiled this. This guy got away. Again, this was in, in the era of not having detachables, so in, in, on her shelf, I should say, they were available. Thankfully, there was a narrowing here, so no harm done. It didn't get away to the IVC. But ideally, you could be okay here with just coiling the front door, the, just the fistulous connection here. So we closed both ends, not planned here, and used only 10 ml of low osmolar contrast media. And you can see here, because this is dilution 2 and 10, you can see there was a second branch. This is not gone. This fistula is not resolved yet. We accessed the second branch, and you can see an extra layer, the third coil, location here, and that is the second component from that pseudoaneurysm uh, from uh, biopsying. And so they, they were pushable, not detachable coils. Now in my practice, I would use exclusively detachable. It's just more predictable, obviously. Um, think about using CO2, and in fact, CO2 can be much more useful also for a tips in a child because the CO2 stays around longer than the contrast. And so, for example, a TIPS procedure is something I would consider CO2 for. Uh, if you want detail, it's difficult. So if you can use some contrast for a roadmap, that's ideal. But for the overall view, CO2 can work very well. And then the ultrasound follow-up, we have follow-up now for about seven, eight years, and you can see at this point no further pseudoaneurysms, a more appropriate um, arterial waveform uh, when you compare the pre and the post, and they've, they've had annual ultrasound showing the same. Another renal intervention, a biopsy, and this was performed by nephrology. And you can see patient had an acute drop in hemoglobin, a very poorly defined kidney with poor corticomedullary differentiation and active, it looks like active extravasation there from the kidney. And this patient did not respond to um, good hemodynamic like 40 per kilo replacement. 
again, post biopsy, so you're thinking pseudoaneurysm or AV fistula. We again, in this case, we also used CO2 angiography with a combination of selective low osmolar contrast media, less than 10 again, which is kind of the adult guidelines, worked off a, a roadmap here and went in with super selective. And the reason we did that is because it was a lower pole AV fistula without any active extravasation at this point. Look at the contemporaneous visualization of IVC and renal vein and renal artery. Lower pole here, we placed a microcatheter, low flow, and we did a couple of detachable coils in this location. And these were not straight, these were small tornadoes. I had to sacrifice a little bit here of renal parenchyma because the feeding vessel needed to be closed. But interestingly, and there are the coils in the lower pole of the kidney, this patient had a follow-up CT. Perfusion looks eh, not as good, but okay in that lower pole. The patient had a follow-up. I'm sorry, did I have it here? Okay, no, not in this case. I'll show you a different one. So basically, the follow-up here, you have good perfusion throughout the kidney. We used low-dose contrast. We used a fluoro overlay technique and a roadmap. And a fluoro overlay technique means that you do a run. You can overlay that run on the fluoro and use it for the entire case, which is something we commonly do now because it can be, you can save the image you want from the run and make that your roadmap uh, instead of repeating a roadmap um, using a second amount of contrast. It's called fluoro overlay. It's, I think, on all of the major um, imaging systems, Philips and Siemens particularly and it can cut down your contrast a lot, and you can window for R2, for vessels, window for the wire, window for the catheter. You can change the window level depending on what you want to see. I have become much more comfortable, and I, I, I really um, suggest that you do too with CO2 angiography since the inception of the CO2 commander. And Jim Caridi is the person who first really described using CO2 angiography in a really robust way, mostly in adults, but has reported it also in children, and particularly in renal artery interventions, including angioplasty and uh, renal intervention for bleeding. And uh, shown no significant change in the creatinine level after CO2 angiography, which you'd expect. And here he's writing about angioplasty. I recently went to an SIR session about a year ago, and it was a two-hour session on CO2 angiography. I thought it was extremely enlightening. He is also the co-designer of the CO2 commander, which makes you feel much better about using something that contains inverted commas an air-like substance. Um, in the days of using the tank and trusting that it's not air, that it is actually CO2, there's a certain discomfort level with people who don't do CO2 venography very often for access planning or angiography, and, and it becomes an uncomfortable situation. This is a pre-filled um, canister and device, and you can see um, it's self-enclosed. It's only going to be CO2. It's not going to be mixed up with air. I strongly urge you to look at this device if you want to use CO2 angiography in your practice and certainly to think about it in children more commonly than it has been. In terms of renal uh, trauma, um, it is still relatively uncommon. This is a nephrology paper, not a radiology paper. And looking at 438 biopsies here from Europe, you can see that the rate of bleeding is still very small. Um, you know, small, small numbers of six out of 438 needing intervention, either cystoscopic or angiographic, 1.3%, 0.6 for blood transfusion, very, very small numbers. But there are papers out there, again, not interventional radiology, with, with reported rates of up to 12% for AV fistulas with biopsy, and 7.5%. So it does occur, it does occur in various degrees of frequency. It's very uncommon here. I've seen two in the last few years. And again, biopsies are commonly performed by nephrologists in our institution. Then talking about trauma, uh, more uh, non-iatrogenic trauma now. This is a girl that uh, was hit by a horse and came to the ED. And one of our few patients that came directly from the ER to IR for an intervention. She was stable, but just about stable. Clearly has a grade like three, four liver laceration, 
uh, with active extravasation and hemoperitoneum. She arrives directly to the IR suite, having been stabilized in the ER and seen by the surgeons. And uh, she's uh, the, the daughter, I, I chuckle about this, the daughter of a med physician. So, of course, she'll have a normal variant. You know, she's not going to have a hepatic artery coming off the normal location uh, because, you know, she's not going to be our run of the mill patient. And you can see here, so she has an aberrant um, normal variant right hepatic artery, incredibly spasm. And she was in shock, and she was getting replacement in the room and had a hemoperitoneum. And this is how her hepatic artery looked. And she did not have any active extrav. But we know it should be somewhere in this area. So what happened between here, bottom left, and bottom right? I had already prophylactically started to put in coils. Great, like I mentioned earlier to you, and to no avail earlier. Um, what did we see? Well, her blood pressure started to come up. They gave her some epinephrine. They gave her more blood products. And what we find is now we have a less vasospastic hepatic artery system. And now we actually did a sort of a provocative bleeding test. And here we are with active extravasation. Now, again, because it's extremely small, because she's still in shock, we got to deploy here straight helal coils that I mentioned earlier. One. 1.5 centimeters, that's all you could get in. As I said, you're not going to coil a tornado there. And they're fuzzy, and they cause immediate occlusion because they're, they've got fuzzy thrombogenic attachments to them. And they're pushable. Again, they're not detachable. But this is a very safe location for that. And she was somebody that actually left the building within one week completely well and having resolved her hemorrhage on the table that particular night. So lessons learned here, you may only see the bleeding site after improvement in blood pressure occurs with, with resuscitation in the room. And um, vessel spasm is very common if you're shocked and you may need to use the smallest coils on your shelf, which we have are the straight coils. And of course, just, you know, I expect normal variants in patients who have like medical family members. It's just one of these things where why would it be a normal straightforward hepatic angio? Another patient who came with a blow to their back playing rugby, renal injury. Again, active extravasation. The injury is violating Gerota's fascia. They have intra-abdominal blood. It's going beyond the, um, the capsule into the fascia here into the intraperitoneal area. And the patient was stable enough to have come to IR. It was not an ER. Uh, it was not considered a surgical requirement. And you can see the extravasation there beyond Gerota's fascia right into the, the um, abdominal cavity. Again, we do an angio. And he had needed at least 40 per kilo of replacement now, so we're not going to observe this patient after that. And you can see the active extravasation. Again, very small vessels going to that area, and we want to preserve as much kidney as we can. Again, we, in this case, we did choose a tornado, and the tornado was eh, didn't deploy so well. This is what we struggle with when vessels are very small. It did its job, but it also is sort of abutting a normal vascular territory also here. But you can see the blush has disappeared, and this portion of kidney is rather beaten up at this point, so we're not going to get good perfusion in it. And there's a questionable area of perfusion here, presumably because this coil is doing some you know, agitation of that lower pole artery. But interestingly, in the follow-up CT scan, you can see the coil here centrally. This is still parenchyma that needs to resolve post-hematoma. There's, a, there's a, some um, necrosis there. And you have a normal perfusion of that lower pole kidney. So despite it looking a little bit circumspect after our embolization, it has recovered completely on this follow-up CT scan. And the patient had a normal creatinine. We a uh, patient here three years of age with blunt abdominal trauma considered possible. Um, you know. Uh, child abuse, not sure. And all we saw were these low-grade subcapsular collections, complex, uh, very difficult to interpret CTA, very poor contrast, as you can see, super low dose. Patient was, con they were concerned the patient was still bleeding. And so we did an angiogram. You can see here the mass effect from the subcapsular hematomas 
uh, in the liver that look organized. So these are not actually a, a hyperacute. There may be, we wondered if there was some hyperattenuating change here in both of these that was layering. Uh, I think that may be true, but again, as I said, the quality of the scan is super low dose, so there's no active extravasation. That's an arterial phase. This was a delayed venous phase, bottom left, with maybe some increased attenuation in that right subcapsular collection, which is why we went to angio. And we couldn't find anything, but a lot of spasm. So what we did was we did a prophylactic gel foam embolization, like I explained to you before, with the 2 ml, 1 ml syringes, a half-closed three-way stopcock, and we used a low-flow microcatheter, and this is what we find. We have patent main arteries with very poor distal flow, which is called pruning, which is what we want because we're trying to decrease the perfusion pressure in the liver and decrease some occult bleeding sites that we could not find, and this patient just didn't require another intervention. Uh, too low a dose of CT, we concluded, can't really get good information, a negative angiogram, but a three-year-old on our table that was thought to be still bleeding, so we did a gel foam embolization, which may also, and it's shown in the spleen, may reduce venous pressure, not just arterial. We don't know this is an arterial bleed, and there was no tumor that we could see that was causing this. Talking about tumor, to move on to that, if a child is bleeding from a minor trauma, and this kid was a minor fall in a playground that was flown in from New Jersey, think about two big things, or three. Think about a tumor that bled spontaneously from the minor trauma, a UPJ obstruction, or some cystic abdominal lesion, a splenic cyst, liver cyst, or some intra-abdominal cyst that caused um, bleeding with minor trauma. Think about a reason if it does not fit with the level of bleeding. This patient had a significant hemoperitoneum, was in severe shock. The CT revealed a tumor of the liver, which turned out to be a paroblastoma, with active extravasation. Uh, so they came to us because otherwise it was going to try, try and be a major resection of this thing in the OR, and they stabilized them enough to come to the IR suite. It's a good age for a liver lesion, such as a paroblastoma as well. And you can see this, all of this really disorganized architecture coming off the hepatic artery, being injected through a microcatheter, blobs, I mean necrosis of the lesion most likely, and active extravasation outside and inside the tumor. Again, here, the straight coils were our friend. I did, um, we did straight coils and PVA, like 250 to 350, because you have a tumor, so you need to embolize the tumor. It's necrotic, and you need to kill that feeding artery. So we did a combination of PVA embolization and coils. I'm showing this case because we thought we were done after one set of coils. The patient had a peritoneal catheter in to drain the hemoperitoneum because they were difficult to ventilate. And on the table, I promptly started to aspirate the hemoperitoneum so the anesthesia people could ventilate the patient. And the patient completely bottomed out blood pressure wise again. At which point we thought, oh my, we have, we have elimin reduced or eliminated the tamponade effect, and the rest of this tumor may be bleeding. Now you've got to go back up there again and start accessing a similar or an adjacent artery. Now they're in shock again, complicating things even more. But we did successfully access a second branch that was also in the lower portion of that top right picture, now revealing itself to be bleeding. It wasn't so impressive prior. And at this point now, because the compression effect is gone, you have now active extravasation from the inferior portion. We put in more PVA and more coils and left the catheter in while removing more hemoperitoneum. So lesson learned here is that if you are going to have to decompress hemoperitoneum, do not lose access to the parent vessel, particularly if you, have, if you foresee that the hemoperitoneum or whatever you're removing is creating a tamponade effect. Stay in there until the patient has revealed that they're stable and then remove the catheter, which is a um, lesson learned in this case. We see some penetrating trauma, all major cities do. Um, now CTA has taken away from a lot of our diagnostic angio, and so after that it behooves us to decide what to do with this lesion. Um, 
We used to do diagnostic to even diagnosis in the past. This patient has an end arterial pseudoaneurysm coming from the anterior tibial artery. And in this case, again, our straight coils are our friend. It was very spasmed more distally. There did not appear to be a back an exit and entry vessel. And so we essentially blocked the parent feeding vessel with straight helal coils that have thrombogenic fibers on them. And you're done until follow-up. In this kind of case, this brachial artery, you have to realize when you should not violate with the endovascular therapy. This is a brachial artery and pseudoaneurysm, or brachial slash proximal radial, from a, a stab wound. Again, you can see the yin-yang, the pseudoaneurysm, the stasis in it. So you could argue there's enough stasis in this that maybe you could get away with a thrombin injection. The problem is you have a lot of extrinsic compression of that brachial artery also. So in discussion with the vascular surgeons, this was felt to be a better um, lesion to surgically uh, re remove and over sew and then relieve the pressure of that brachial artery so it doesn't ultimately thrombose and distally embolize end arteries to the hand. May or may not be the only, it's not the only solution. It was the solution in our practice and that was a multidisciplinary discussion. So there is great value to having these multidisciplinary discussions. So in summary, I hope I didn't go on too long. It was about an hour. Um, pediatric uh, IR management of ascotrome is certainly not as commonplace as adults. And we are much, much more conservative in our approach, up to 40, 50 mils per kilo of replacement before anybody decides they need to do an operative or an endovascular um, therapy. And that's, I've shown you literature to support that. Have small devices available, small catheters, small sheets, small coils. Think about using gel foam and small syringes in your practice, particularly if it's not an obvious um, lesion. And as I said before, if you're decompressing any tamponading hematoma, keep your arm, arm catheter in the parent vessel till the patient has revealed that they're stable. Thank you. Hello. Hi, thank you, Dr. Cahill. You're welcome. Um, thank you very much for this really interesting talk. Um, there was a lot of really good cases, which we don't really get to see outside of um, a large uh, pediatric center like CHOP. Um, I, I don't know if it, did, does anyone have any questions right now? Are people still on? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, they're still logged in, but uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to see. We, we can give them a few minutes. If, if we don't have any questions, then I think we can end the, the presentation here. Megan, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I don't. All right. Okay, so again, yeah, again, this the session will be is recorded and will be available on YouTube afterwards. Um, okay. Again, thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Kaiho, for your time and preparing this really interesting talk. You're very welcome. If anybody has questions, they can email me. Maybe they have logged off or they're it's just difficult. I hope they can all hear my presentation, but they can feel free to email me. All right, sounds good. And w would you be able to uh, provide your email address? Or... I will, yeah. My last name, okay. Cahill. Um, let me, actually, I think I have it because I, I set up the. And I know the... Megan has it, yeah. Yeah. So I'll just um, provide it as part of the um, YouTube video link information underneath so people will be able okay. to see it. Okay. And I just got a message here the audience, we can hear you. I don't know which person, but at least I'm hearing we can hear you here. So that's good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, okay, Megan, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Dr. Cahill. Welcome. Okay.